Welcome. In the previous video, we have seen how we can solve the ordinary least squares problem to find the parameter vector which describes the linear model in the best possible way in order to reduce the squared residuals between model and measurements. This I would like to apply to a simple example in this video. In this example, I would like to identify the parameters describing the driving behavior of a car depicted here in steady state. And in particular, I would like to map the velocity v, so the lateral velocity of the car in steady state, against the power p, which is required to maintain this speed in an ideal plane. And we know from first order approaches, if you look into uh, the driving behavior, the power demand of vehicles, that the vehicle power versus uh, velocity demand is normally some kind of a polynomial, to be more specific, up to cubic relation between the velocity and the power. So we can therefore assume, or more or less, define that the power p of the case measurement is identical to a parameter alpha times the velocity k plus a parameter beta times the squared velocity k plus the last parameter gamma times v to the power of 3 at time step k, right? So this is considered our mathematical model of the power versus velocity behavior. So therefore P, the power uh, of the drivetrain which is built in this car, is our output. This is basically what we have described as Y previously. And the Vs are our known inputs, our regressors. So we can therefore rewrite this again in our regressor parameter representation to get v k v square k v cube k times our parameter vector alpha, beta and gamma. So that is a regressor vector, or our regressor vector, at a certain measurement. And that is here our parameter vector w. And p is our measurement y. And of course, um, we now want to identify this parameter vector w. So that means we take our car on a drive track or into the lab. And we will measure the power which is required to maintain a certain speed in steady state because we're identifying here a static model against the velocity, right? So we will take different measurements around this idealized curve, potentially including measurement noise, which is depicted here. So we take measurements. on the street or in the lab. And again, we take up to capital N measurements. So oh, not N, but P1, the first measurement point, to Pn, the last measurement point for the power. And on the right hand side, we get v1, v square 1, and v cube 1. So these are our regressors, and we also take up to n measurements of the regressors. And we multiply the regressor matrix as usual 
with our parameter vector alpha, beta, and gamma. Right? So this again makes measurement vector y is equal to regressor vector z or regressor matrix z and parameter vector w. Right? And how we can solve this, we have seen in the previous video. So the best possible parameter, w star, would be z transpose times that inverse times that transpose times y. Right? So that would be our solution here also for this specific problem. And in order to identify our static car model, we can go into a little bit of Julia code where we have basically set up a numerical experiment to do so. So what we are going to do here first is we get some, some packages for obvious reasons and then we define parameters. What you can see here are some physically inspired parameters like a drag coefficient or rolling friction coefficient and so on which we do not find here in alpha, beta, gamma, because this is not a um, drivetrain or car engineering session. But uh, what we basically do here, we utilize some parameters, uh, physically inspired parameters, from which we then condense our alpha, beta, gamma, such that alpha, beta, gamma are realistic values, right? So actually, how we get alpha, beta, gamma is not so important but it is important that alpha, beta, gamma are somehow realistically chosen here in this uh, example. If you're interested in what these values mean and how we can determine them, I'm uh, recommending a lecture on car engineering or drivetrain engineering. Okay, so based on this um, parameters, what we do here is basically we uh, utilize uh, some, some data so we basically um, go through a range of different speeds. Uh, the speed is in uh, miles per uh, in meters per second. However, what we define here is basically our range, which is from zero kilometers per hour until 200 kilometers per hour. So 200 kilometers per hour, very fast. As uh, this video is currently uh, generated in Germany, a pretty normal speed for the German autobahn. So that means between zero and 200 kilometers per hour, which is here uh, transferred into meters per second to be with the SE unit system, we basically sample different speeds and then we generate um, our inputs and outputs from that, okay? And then, yeah, we set up our uh, regressor matrix, right? So we take here basically our uh, outputs, y, where there might be some potential uh, measurement noise also. For the current time, we have just deactivated the noise. We will activate it later on. And we set up here our regressor vector or regressor matrix set, which then becomes this very long but somehow thin matrix because we just have three regressors but per regressor, many measurement points. So that's why a thin but long matrix. Okay, and then we put basically everything together in our least square solution, which you can also see here at that point, right? So we have our uh, Z transpose times Z inverse times Z transpose times Y, which we can see also in the Julia code. And the result of that is this parameter vector, which is basically roughly 224 and uh, 0.45. And if we look a little bit up here in our definition of the condensed parameter vector, which would be this one, so this would be our ground truth vector, then we can basically compare that here to our parameter vector w, which we have identified using least squares. And as you can see, it's basically the same values. So the identification was very successful which is not a big deal because we have assumed so far that the power measurements, our outputs, are without any measurement noise. If we plot then 
this measurements, so here we can see basically our measurement curve uh, against the model predictions. So the model predictions here are the green bullets and the red bullets are the measurements. They're exactly laying over each other because we didn't consider any measurement noise here. What we get from this is we can compare here the um, estimated parameters, the identified parameters and the ground truth parameters. So here the estimated parameters with that hat, alpha hat, beta hat and gamma hat basically means estimated or identified and here without this hat on top would be the real, the true ground truth parameters that perfectly lay over each other. However, as we said, um, in our model assumption we can also assume that the measurements might have some noise on top of it because maybe the, the drivetrain tower measurement device in this car is not accurate and it might be noisy. So what we can also do is we can go to our example here and we can basically um, add a little bit of noise uh, to it. So here, let's say we have a noise amplitude up to one kilowatt and we will redo our identification and do also the plotting again. So let's see it here. And what we can see from this, uh, first of all, that due to the noise, now some of the reddish bullet points, so the data is not ideally on the model line, on this ground truth model line, because we have this random noise impact. However, we can see that the error between the estimated model, so which is here basically in green, and the idle ground, ground truth data is not really big. So we can therefore see that the noise did not really um, strongly uh, decrease the accuracy of the identified model. However, what we can see is that the physical interpretation of the identified models and the physical ground truth model parameters, they are now much different. So right, we have an impact on the found parameters, but the found parameters, although they are deviating from the ground truth parameters, have been altered in such a way that the model accuracy is still very good. So what we can uh, obtain from this is that this identification was successful, although noise was present when it comes to the model prediction accuracy, but the noise had a negative impact on the found parameter vector. We can also go into some animated view of this where, as you can see down here, we basically uh, sweep through different noise levels. At the very beginning, we actually do not consider any noise and then increase the noise level over time. And what you can see is that even only small noise levels are available, that this physical interpretation of the parameter vector um, gets decreased uh, quite soon, whereas the overall model accuracy uh, is only minorly affected, right? So therefore, the main uh, outcome from this is that the model in terms of the pure data prediction accuracy seems to be quite robust, even for higher levels of noise, while the physical interpretability or the physical correctness of this identified parameter vector is severely impacted by noise. And this will also motivate more um, sophisticated identification methods, which might also consider certain boundary conditions, right? So that we say, okay, these parameters uh, which are related to drag, for example, they should be like positive all the time because a negative parameter would be something like a, a positive power which is generated by drag which would actually accelerate the current, not deaccelerate it, that we can uh, implement and consider such constraints in more powerful identification procedures in one of the following lectures. Thank you for listening and see you in the next video.